as we all know, COVID-19 has affected almost every single person in, in every single industry. But how has it affected you and the work of your team at the MRC Human Genetics Unit? Were you able to continue research remotely or was it put on hold? Very good question. Yeah, of course, it's affected everybody. Um, I mean, at first, we're incredibly lucky to have a job, <laughs> a secure job. Um, and when we first locked down in March, you know, the, we didn't have very much notice. The laboratories were just shut. Everyone had to leave, uh, go home. The uh, IT specialists in the university were very good at getting everybody remote access into the compute systems. So for the first few months, it was OK. You know, everyone got used to Zoom and there was, they had plenty of data to analyze. You know, we, we, we generate so much data in science these days. We actually spend a, a long time sitting on computers analyzing it. So we could do that for a while, but eventually we ran out of data. All the data got analyzed and we couldn't generate any new data. And then it became difficult. And I found it very difficult to keep people motivated and interested when they couldn't do their science. So we, we, we did lots of other activities like journal clubs, discussing other people's work just to try and keep everybody going. Luckily, the, the laboratories were reopened in July. So we only lost a few months uh, of being completely shut down. But they were, op where they were opened um, on a limited basis as they are now. So we, we obviously have to respect social distancing. Uh, so we have a, a limit on the occupancy of the building. Uh, we run four shifts a day. So we start at seven o'clock in the morning um, through till eight or nine o'clock at night. So people can book a shift within that time period. Uh, so people have started working rather odd hours, which suits suit, suit some people very well. Um, so in theory, people can do everything now they could before. But it, it still doesn't feel the way it did before. It, it feels a bit flat. Because what we're missing, is, you know, the fun part of doing science is all those kind of casual interactions you have with your colleagues where you suddenly spark a conversation or you share an idea with someone or a piece of, you know, a result that you're really excited about. And that's all gone, of course. You know, now we have these pre-scheduled um, Zoom meetings where you have an agenda and you talk about something very specific, which is fine. It's, you know, it, it's good. Um, but, yeah, the, the, the thing that really makes science fun, the creativity and the energy is missing and I really long for that to come back I hope it will the good side has been I get to travel a lot less I don't have to get up at four o'clock in the morning and get on a plane to the other side of the world so often um, and I enjoyed that at the beginning but again now I'm just missing meeting my colleagues from around the world because again yeah you can listen to them and give a seminar on zoom <clears throat> but it's not the same as hanging out with them in the coffee break or in the pub afterwards and just getting to know people so yeah it's 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 interaction uh, with people we're, we're definitely missing but I, I have to, I'm really proud of the Institute what it did during COVID we did some really important things first of all we set ourselves up as a testing site we have very good interactions with the NHS because of um, clinical genetics uh, and our involvement in that so we talked to them and said hey we can help you you know we know how to do a PCR reaction it's our bed bread and butter so we, we established ourselves as a node of the local NHS Lothian COVID testing centre um, a couple of the postdocs took it upon themselves to look at the way the NHS were doing their COVID testing and said, that's not very good. I can design a better assay. So we developed a new PCR assay, um, generated new reagents for doing that faster and better. And we were contacted by the Medical Research Council that said, and who said, because um, the Medical Research Council mainly has units within the UK, but it has some in Africa. Uh, with a particular interest in, in um, tropical diseases, infectious diseases. And they said, can you help out the Gambia? Because they have no uh, testing center for COVID. So we were able to make all the reagents for COVID testing in Gambia and West Africa and ship them all out there. That was great. Uh, so very proud that we did that. We uh, were able to use our own test then to test ourselves. So we test all our staff uh, in the building twice a week, which has made a great difference, gives people much more confidence about coming into work um, as well uh, we've been rolling that out to the university as well particularly helping them with um, for example the veterinary students who have to go out into the community and do their clinical practice the final year of vet, vet students so we've been testing them as well um, and then the other thing we did was um, one of the things that the unit does in its normal research 
is we study uh, human genetics at population scale. So we go out and we collect large numbers of individuals who might have a particular characteristic and control populations and compare their, their genetics, their genotype. So we had all the systems in place for doing that, for doing all the ethical permissions, for doing the project management, for sending out what we call the spit piss, the, the spit tests in the post, you know, tubes you can spit into to make DNA and, and receiving them, tracking them, having the data management systems. Um, so we were able to team up with a colleague of ours who is an intensive care physician who was leading the um, an international effort to look for the human genetic variation that will predispose uh, individuals to very severe outcomes from COVID infection. So we basically sampled people who ended up in intensive care with COVID um, and, and looked to see, do they have particular genetic variants um, that, that distinguish them from the rest of the population, for example? So we were able to use our expertise to, to help co-lead that study, and that was published at the end of last year. And indeed, we found five or six sites in the human genome with really strong signatures indicating a very severe outcome from COVID infection, which is interesting and important of itself. But what it really does is, is tell you a bit about more about the biology of the disease and also tells you where you might focus your efforts if you want to make develop new therapies and, and drugs which will help to reduce mortality um, from COVID. So, you know, you'll all have heard about the successes with dexamethasone, for example. So we can see now in the genetic signature that there are other kind of pathways in our cells which might be worth thinking about targeting um, to, to reduce the inflammation. So a lot of those very severe outcomes from COVID come from not from the initial, initial viral infection, but the way your own immune system reacts to the virus. And, and if it goes out of control, uh, it really starts to damage your own organs. So I, I, I'm very proud of that piece of work that everybody did. So at the, at the beginning of the pandemic, I thought, well, we're not we're not an infectious biology unit, so I don't think we'll have much contribution. But it turns out we did actually. Yeah. And and over and, and also the other thing to say, I'm I'm it's made me even more proud to be a scientist actually. I'm, I'm you know I'm not a vaccinologist and things, but but to look at the way the scientific community is pulled together to to churn, to make and churn out vaccines so quickly is just uh, amazing, fantastic. And, it's, and great, um, it's great to see science all over the media for a change. You know, usually it's on the back page. Some, now it's front page. There's never a better time to get into science. Uh, even the, the, the politicians of every colour realise how important it is. And that you can't just turn it on at a tap. You have to invest in the foundations, the skill set, the people, the infrastructure. But we should capitalise on that now. So if you want to be a scientist, go for it. Um, and when working with uh, biological scientists, we know that we need um, knowledge from biology, chemistry and math. But uh, what other skills would you be looking at students who want to work in genetics? Yeah, really good question. Um, yeah, biology has changed completely from when I was a student. I mean, literally, I, mean, I spent most of my time doing what we call wet science, you know, getting my hands wet, doing stuff. And, and the result was maybe one band on a gel or something, or something you could analyse on a piece of paper. Now we churn out massive data sets, which you can't analyze on a piece of paper anymore. So we need computational skills. We need people who, have, who understand how to program. We need people who understand artificial intelligence and informatics, machine learning. Uh, these have all become critical skills for biomedicine, actually, not skills that I have at all. Um, so in our, we are actually we've been interviewing for PhD students today. Uh, we set two of our, we have ten, uh, eight, eight students a year, and we set two of, two of those aside to bring in people who have no biology background at all, who completely come from the physical sciences. And we do that also now at postdoctoral level. We bring in, we deliberately bring in postdoctoral uh, fellows who have no biology background at all. We teach them the biology, they bring their ideas. So we you know, we recruited, for example, theoretical physicists who worked at CERN. And they bring a completely different way of looking at science and a completely different skill set in terms of data analysis that we don't have. So it's become very multidisciplinary. Disciplinary. But, but yeah, data, data really matters now. As the last question from us, what advice would you give to students who 
might be looking at careers in biochemistry, genetics, or just science in general? Yeah, if you if you if you love science, do it. It's a fantastic career. I mean, can you imagine getting paid to just follow your nose, follow your curiosity? I I I, I consider it a hobby still. I don't really think of it as a job. It's so exciting. Can you, it, it's amazing to think to discover something that nobody else in the whole of humanity has ever found out before. You'll be the first person on the planet to discover it. It's, it's an amazing privilege. Um, you get great. You know, it's it's very interactive. It's global. You get to travel a lot, meet great people, work with colleagues. Um, yeah, it, it's wonderful. Of course, it's frustrating. You know, all jobs are frustrating. Uh, and sometimes the funding seems a little insecure, but I think that's true of many jobs in, in the current uh, economy. So uh, in the past, it's had a bad press for being unstable, poorly paid. And things. I, I think that has changed. You know, the, the pay's OK. You're not going to get rich. If, you know, if you want to get rich, don't do science. But if you want to have a really fulfilling life and career, yeah, do it. Only do it if you love it. And don't worry too much about what you study at university. I don't think that matters so much because I said, you know, we're trying to bring in people with all kinds of backgrounds in science uh, now. So, you know, you don't necessarily have to do medicine or biology and you can come in from doing physics or computing or robotics or engineering, all kinds of backgrounds. And certainly don't, I, I know um, when we've had, um, um, school students visiting here sometimes they've said oh well I want to do biomedical research I want to do medical research so I'm I, I, I know I need to go to medical school and become a doctor no you don't you can become you, you can train to become a chemist and do biomedical research you don't need to become a clinician some of our researchers are clinicians some are not so lots lots of ways in and and the other thing that is changing and I think this is very a good change as well the boundaries between academia and industry are becoming blurred. There's much more um, working together. We've seen that in the vaccines, haven't we, with AstraZeneca working with Oxford, hand in hand with Oxford University. So I think we've the universities and the industry realise we need each other. And there's a lot more partnership as well. Uh, and it used to be if, if you moved out of academia into industry, you know, you, you were thought to be lost to scientific research. That That's not true anymore. Um, scientists from, from companies give presentations at conferences, people will move backwards and forwards between industry and universities. Some people have joint appointments, for example. So that that's a really interesting area as well. Um, you know, so there's some there's some really very big pharma companies and biomedical companies within the UK, which are now providing a, an alternative career path and working hand in hand with some of the best biomedical institutes. So now we're going to move on to some of the questions that have been sent in by the members of the society. And I think we'll start with um, Mittal. He's got a question from one of the students. Um, so this question um, uh, involved. All right. So. The question was. Um, why don't uh, offspring have a mix of their parents characteristics so i um the mother having pink hair or, and the father having brown brown or black hair why yeah. can't the offspring have a mix yeah so so this goes back to the origin origin of genetics doesn't it and mendel's work with peas uh, that you couldn't have blended characteristics you, you were either smooth or wrinkly peas or white or purple flowers um, so that the genes were indivisible units um, and, and of course he was right uh, and, and they still are um, so the answer to your question de uh, depends on what the characteristic is you're talking about so a lot of things you mentioned things like hair color are not controlled by one gene they're controlled by a whole set of different genes. And so, of course, you can get incredible combinations of genes. So it looks like you can get a blended characteristics um, with the exception of red hair. So red hair is one of the few human characteristics which essentially is affected by a single gene, a gene called MC1R. Um, and if you have a mutation in the MC1R gene that stops the protein working properly and you have a, that copy of the mutant gene, 
on both your chromosomes, one for your mother and your father, uh, then you will almost inevitably have red hair. Um, whereas neither of your parents necessarily had red hair because they because this is a recessive allele, so they could have had a wild one wild type copy of MC1R and and one mutant copy. So there is there there the genetics is just like Mendel's peas. You can follow it through. But most other human characteristics, height, for example, eye color, skin color, hair color, is what we call polygenic. It's controlled by many many genes. I mean. And we don't even know how many genes. We know some of them, but we don't know the full set yet. So it becomes much more complex once we started thinking about um, combining the effects of different genes together. I hope that kind of answered the question. Yeah, it did. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So the next question was sent in from was sent in by Ajay Sadasivan from Year Eight. He says, what are the views on genetic, what are your views on genetic editing? And do you think something should be done to prohibit it? Good question. Very topical, of course. So, yeah, one, one of the amazing techn technology advances is, is we have these CRISPR tools um, that allow us to very, like a pair of scissors to go in and very specifically in, uh, in, in with great control change specific bases in the genome. <clears throat> so we have the uh, ability if there's a mutation which causes a disease to go in and correct that mutation in an individual and, and in theory help um, ameliorate the symptoms of that disease. So the answer to your question depends on what you mean by gene editing So and, and in which cells. So I think everybody considers that editing the germline of, the, of our genome, the, the version of the genome that's going to be passed to our children is a no-no. That's not acceptable. But what is acceptable is to edit the genome in specific cells of our body. So, And, there, and there, that's already been done um, for particular human disorders, particularly of the blood system, um, because we can get to the stem cells of the blood. So with individuals who've got devastating mutations, that affect, for example, their ability to make proper immune cells so that they're immune deficient. We can take the stem cells out of those individuals, knowing what the mutation is, and use gene editing to correct that, and then put the stem cells back into the individual. So those edited cells are never going to contribute, obviously, to the next generation. They just affect the health of the individual whose cells are being edited. So I, I personally, I see uh, no ethical problem with that. I'd, I'd be interested to know what your opinions are. To me, it's the ultimate disease treatment. You know, if we know a disease is caused by mutation gene, if we can fix it, why not? As long as it doesn't, you know, as long as we don't touch the germline. Yeah, I completely agree. But I also think that there are quite a few risks involved in allowing, I guess, wider access to technology like CRISPR. Mm -hmm. And just as a, an extra follow up question, yeah. is there any um, overarching international governing body that kind of decides the laws on what you can edit and, and cannot? Yeah, what, a, what an interesting question. Um, you know, when molecular biology first started in the 1970s, the same, there were the same kind of fears um, that, you know, mad scientists were going to create new species and, and create havoc. Um, and, there, and there was an international body set up then to govern what was allowable in molecular biology. That hasn't happened with, uh, with gene editing at international level, but it, it has at national level. And actually, the UK is very often held up uh, as a real example of good practice in this area because we have the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, which was established to help govern IVF treatment, for example, and we have the, the Human Tissue uh, Authority. So we're, we're very tightly regulated when it comes to human um, tissue and, and human uh, engineering in the UK. But that's not, those, these are not international standards. And of course, you will have heard about the example from China where there was, uh, can, you know, uh, illegal cloning, well, not illegal, yeah, under the table, right under the radar cloning. So, yeah, is it possible to set international standards? I don't know. Um, I think it's probably best done at, at, at national European Union level, for example. America also regulates what, what can go on. So, so it's not the completely wild west. It's kind of a halfway house. 
Um, this was a question posed by Niraj in year 10, and um, they basically wanted to ask that genetic editing is a very big and vast industry with new technology emerging day by day. So would it be possible for us in the future to restore extinct species and specifically humans as well? So they gave the example of Neanderthals and woolly mammoths. Yeah, great question. The Jurassic Park question. Um, yeah, I've got, I've got a friend who's a famous paleontologist and we, we talk about this sometimes, whether we can recreate dinosaurs. So it, I, I, don't think, I don't think you do it by gene editing. I think you do it by synthetic biology, what I just talked about um, with, with the experiments we're doing in yeast. So in theory, you could, if you knew the sequence of them, if you had enough Neanderthal genomes and you could write down the complete sequence of Neanderthal genomes from one end to the other, you could, in theory, resynthesize it. Could you get it into a cell and make it work again? Possibly. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's not impossible. Is anybody going to do it right now? No, it's, it's beyond our technical capabilities at the moment. Um, but, it, but in theory, you, you could start to introduce characteristics from extinct species into extant species. And, and people sometimes do do that to test ideas as well about biology and evolution. So, yeah, I wouldn't. I used to say I thought it was impossible. Now I've changed my mind. I think in, in theory it would be possible. Never say never. <laughs> never say never. Yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm not sure anyone will fund it at the moment, but <laughs> or, or whether you'll get it through the, the regulatory authorities. But it's technically feasible, I would imagine. Yes. I think Jordi also had a um, additional uh, a question that he asked, asking about uh, your beliefs on the politicization of science, especially in recent uh, months with COVID and how politics has kind of been a lot more tied into science. Yeah. And it's got a lot more involved. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, it has. Um... Yeah, I don't, I don't, it's a difficult one. Um, not, uh, as a scientist, you're never trained to really understand politics or how politicians work. And it's, uh, I have to do that now more in my role as director than I ever did before. And it's taken me a long time to realise that politicians think in a different way from scientists. Um, and and they, want, they want solutions and they don't want uncertainties and they don't want questions. So it's a difficult dialogue. Um, I don't envy the people that are on, who are on SAGE trying to advise the government. The government's obviously made quite a lot of mistakes, but they've got some things right, right? The vaccines, right? And, uh, and the Joint Vaccination Committee has been very, very good. So I'm pleased to say that they are listening now to scientific advice much more than they have in the past. Long may it continue. There are some interesting schemes funded by different organizations to try and pair scientists with politicians to see each other's worlds. I think that's a really good idea. I wish there were more scientists in, in, in politics. That would be really useful. I think politics really lacks diversity. There too many of them have been to the same schools, done the same thing at university. Uh, it would be really benefit from having people who have a scientific mind uh, in, in government. Uh, and, and I hope many people who go on to do PhDs will think about that as a career. Um, on, the, on the contrary, we don't want politics interfering too much in science. There's something called the Haldane Principle that was set up um, when things like the Medical Research Council were established that said politicians will fund science, but they won't tell you what to do with the money. Scientists will decide what's the best way to spend the money. That was held sacred for a very long time. I think it's been eroded quite a lot. There's much more top down direction now about the way the money should be spent. Part of the science budget still works that way with scientists deciding exactly what to do. But there's these new initiatives you'd heard about this kind of Dominic Cummings ARPA initiative, which I, I fear is too politically driven. It's too much top down. This is what we're going to do. It's OK to have challenge led science, I think, particularly in a national emergency. 
if you need, you know, you need a new vaccine for infectious disease. But largely, I think politicians should stay out of it and let scientists decide what science should be done. So, yeah, it's an uneasy relationship. Um, there's, but there's more dialogue than there used to be. There needs to be more. So but one, of, one of the things I've, I had to do in the last two years was interact with the Scottish government to persuade them to fund the genome sequencing of all the children in Scotland who are born with a severe disorder, so, because they're most likely to be caused by uh, mu new mutations, uh, almost always. Um, and of course, we've had the technical capability to do that for a while, but actually persuading them of the social, the medical, the economic benefit of doing that takes a lot of work uh, to embed that into the infrastructure of the country. It, it, it was an interesting thing to do and, we, and, it, and it worked. So as in England now, genome, genome, what we're calling genomic medicine is becoming part of standard of care in the health service, both for severe childhood disease and also for cancer. So that I think that's it, certainly in biomedicine, that's where um, the politics and the science meet, really, is in how we get discoveries and advances in science into the NHS very quickly. So I think that concludes the questions that um, we as students have. Um, but if any of the teachers wanted to ask any questions really quick before the end, Feel free to unmute and ask, yeah. I did have one question earlier, but I think one of the students asked it better than I could have. And it was really that point you made about um, biology changing so fast. What do you wish we at school level and university level were doing differently to better prepare our students so that they can enter this field and be successful in it? Yeah, te teaching them quantitative skills. Yeah. Teaching them programming and uh, in basic informatics. Definitely. I think until you mentioned that, it never occurred to me that that was a skill that actually we need to be encouraging. We tell our biologists they should be doing biology and chemistry in particular if they're interested in this field. It never occurred to me to say yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. computation, statistics, mathematics. Yeah, it, the biology completely changed. It's now become a data driven science. Yeah, so you need to understand how to handle and analyze data and apply the right analytical tools to it. Thank you. Good. Yeah, so I think if there's if there aren't Wait. any more questions, I oh yeah, sorry, Michael, go ahead. Um, yeah, um sorry, Robert. Um I have quick two few uh, two questions. Um you know how you previously mentioned um auxins that could degrade the um, the gene. Mm. Um, has it been tested with uh, bacterial cells that produce pathogens to um, it could which could uh, possibly reduce disease? Yeah, the, the effects of disease. Yeah. Not not that I know of. But what you do have to do to degrade the protein, you have to go in actually with gene editing and engineer it to have a little extra domain inserted to allow it to respond to the auxin. So you can't use it to degrade, for example, a bacterial, a normal bacterial or viral protein. You have to have engineered the target to make it auxin degradable. But people are working on other systems which have got similar ideas in which you could use small molecules to target particular things for degradation. And yeah, that that you could see how that could become eventually a way to target particular proteins from invading bacteria and viruses. It's a very interesting area. And it's called it's called chemical chemical genetics now because it's this interaction of, of small molecules with uh, genetic engineering to try and uh, make new systems. Yeah. Um, and my other question was, and because I'm partially uh, astrophysicist of uh, fan. Um, what, what are your views on um, space fusing with uh, genetics in the future? Gosh, how interesting. You know, I, I, I used to, I used to, you know, thinking about life on Earth, I, I wished to think, well, it's, it's such an extraordinary thing. It can only, only have happened once. 
And actually now I, I've changed my mind about that, listening to, you know, the, the improved understanding of the universe and astrophysics. So I, I think, you know, I think there probably will be life forms on other planets. And gosh, I have no idea what, what system they will be based on, whether they will be carbon based life. Yeah. Probably won't be nucleic acids. It won't be DNA or RNA. It'll be some other. Probably has to be a polymer. Uh, to have enough information content but yeah God, but how extraordinary it would be to find another life form and start to understand uh, its information content and how it works incredible yeah thank you well i look forward to seeing your discovery of it in the 50 years time or whatever <laughs> maybe it'll come back from mars <laughs> yeah the samples are due back in 30 years i think so. thank you for answering my questions Okay, so if there aren't any more questions, I think uh, we've learned so much with you being here, even though it's only been, uh, like a, I think, an hour. Yeah. It's, I think you've taught us so much about your work and things you've doing your journey through school. And I think it's been very inspirational, especially to some of the younger students. They can look at you and they can see how they could go and into Absolutely. the profession of science. Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah, good. Well, then, then that then that makes my job worthwhile if I can convey that to you. Yeah. And yeah, so, it, it, enjoy learning. Uh, enjoy spending your life learning new things. Well, thank you, Professor Bickmore, for coming yeah. to talk to us today. Well, thank well, you so much. Thank you. Good luck in your in your the rest of your school time and such unusual times. And yeah, thank you to the teachers for keeping it all going as well. School must be really difficult. And, and good luck in whatever you choose to do next.